Mosa Thomas. Growing up, Mosa always was always a bit indifferent to having children. She always felt like she'd be okay having children or not having children. However, the last 12 years of her life have proved that this, or though <coughs> this thought came to be a bit, bit outrageous, excuse me. You see, as the mother of two boys, 13 months apart, she can ima can't imagine having a life without children. Sure, there are a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of mental aptitude trying to stay one step ahead of them <laughs> as, they're, as they learn to navigate life as a preteen. But there are also a lot of funny moments that would, would never have happened without the boys. This is Melissa's second speech from the Professional Speaker's Manual entitled, Life with Boys with a Time of 15 to 20 Minutes. Please help me welcome Melissa Thomas. I made sure to disconnect Siri today so George wouldn't think I was talking to him. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters, Good friends, morning. guests. Two boys, 13 months apart. Did you catch that in the introduction? <laughs> that means that when Brayden, our oldest, was 13 months old, I had an infant at home. Don't ask me anything that happened in their first six years of life, <laughs> because I have no idea. I just know that every day I woke up, took care of two kids. As, as that evolved, the boys each grew into their own different personalities. And by different, I mean as different as black and white, as different as night and day. So I'd like to start by introducing my boys to you. Brayden is going to be 13 in June. God help us all. He is about, he is not about, took him to the doctor yesterday. He is five, five and three quarters, which means now when I look at him, I have to tilt my head slightly over. <laughs> he is definitely in the preteen mode. Everything with Brayden is a challenge. When I tell him the line stops here, he goes, hey, mom, like that. See how far across he can go across that line. Okay. He is an old soul in a little boy's body. He has always been that way. Everything with Brayden is about structure, is about order, and don't you dare change the routine on him or else your whole day is shot. Brayden attends a, the charter school in Leland, so he wears a uniform every day. His, the, the school structure is there. Everything is very academically rigorous. It fits Brayden perfect. He's also recently joined Civil Air Patrol, which is an auxiliary of the United States Air Force. Um, last year, I took Brayden on a trip to the, um, what's it called? We call it the Airplane Museum, the Aviation Museum at the Charlotte Douglas Airport, and he fell in love with airplanes. My husband is retired from the military, so there's always been that underlying theme in our family of military service put those two things together and that's what Brayden has locked on to. So if you ask Brayden now what he wants to be when he grows up, he says, well I'm going to graduate from eighth grade and then I'm going to go to South Brunswick High School and I'm going to be in ROTC. And when I graduate from high school, I'm going to join the Air Force. That is Brayden at age 12. He knows what he's doing. He's got a plan, he's got sights set ahead of him. His brother on the other hand, Nathan, who is the 13 months younger, is everyone's inner child. <laughs> Everything with Nathan is funny. It's a game. You can tell Nathan, this is what our day is going to look like. Five minutes later, you can say, hey, plans change. Give him a new plan five minutes after that time. And he just goes with the flow. He's like, whatever, mom, just tell me what I'm doing next. Everything is fine. Nathan is the kid who age 11, when I take him to Costco, He's gotten a ride on the orange flatbed cart. Now, I have two boys who are preteens, so Costco requires an orange flatbed cart. <laughs> <laughs> he rides on the orange flatbed cart, and every time I go around a corner, he sticks his arms out and goes, whee, 
<laughs> He's going to be 12 in July. He is everybody's inner child. Everything with him is fun and games. Nathan switched schools this year. He goes to South Brunswick Middle School because he wants to be in band. Nathan is not quite five feet tall. He hasn't gone through his growth spurt yet. I think he still weighs less than 90 pounds. And he chose to play the tuba. <laughs> the reason he chose to play the tuba is because it was the loudest instrument that would annoy his brother. <laughs> Not even making that up. He's very good at the tuba. Nathan has been blessed somewhere in our family tree with musical aptitude. He picked up learning the tuba very quickly. Band, the band kids are his people. I didn't realize how much he needed band until I went to visit him at school one day because the, the valves on his tuba were stuck and he said, Mom, you need to bring it into the, to the um, music teacher. Now the tuba he has at home is a tiny tuba. There is a name for it and I don't remember it at the moment, but it's a smaller tuba. It's still a pain to carry with one hand. I kind of have to like put it against my hip and kind of do this number, you know, carrying it down into school. So we got some oil on it, everything was fine. But I had an opportunity to hang out in the band room for a little bit. And as I was hanging out in the band room with all the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, they like to congregate there in the mornings before school. And here comes Nathan, and Nathan's, hi mom, hi, because Nathan's still, when he sees me, hi mom, how are you? Brayden is like, oh my god, that's my mom. Like, you know, <laughs> kind of turns his head away. And as I was looking around the room, I realized, these kids are your people. Just as Civil Air Patrol are Braden's people, everything is order, everything is uniform, band are, band are Nathan's people. So I have, a, I have a, a couple other funny stories. So the, uh, in January when we had the snowstorm, of course the boys didn't have school, which as a parent, the, the, they had already been home for 10 days over, over Christmas break, and then they had four extra days tacked onto that. Yeah. So all of the parents on Facebook were commiserating about the fact that we have these kids home for an extra four days. And I was like, well, there's not really much we can do about it. But we went up in the morning, and the boys look out the window, and it's beautiful. Everything is covered in snow and ice. It's very, very pretty. And Nathan goes, Mom, 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 I want to go outside and I want to build a snowman and I want to play in the snow and when can we go outside and when can we go outside? And I said, well, let's wait like till after lunch when it's maybe, you know, slightly warmer, like five degrees is going to make a huge difference. But anyway, so he's like, okay, that's fine, but I want to build a snowman. And he goes and gets his paper and he starts sketching out what his snowman is going to look like because he's all, he's the creative of the family. So Brayden is talking to him going, we don't have anything to build a snowman. How are you going to build a snowman? Everything is covered in ice. Well, you know, Mr. Negative. Mr. I said, you know what? He'll figure it out. He's got the whole front yard of snow. He'll go outside. He'll figure it out. No problem. Brayden looks at me, and he looks outside, and he looks at me, and he goes, is the mail coming today? And I went, well, I would assume so. Like, normally the mail comes no matter what, right? And he goes, well, how are you going to get to the mailbox? I'm not sure, like it's okay if the mail sits in the box a day or two. Mm -hmm. Not in Brayden's world. <laughs> you get the mail box, you get the mail every day. When we come home at 4.30, how are you gonna get the mail? And he goes, I'm gonna go get dressed and I'm gonna go outside and shovel the driveway. I got one kid who wants to go play, build a snowman and the other kid, Mr. Practical, I gotta go shovel the driveway so mom can get to the mailbox. <laughs> okay, Brayden, go knock yourself out, you know. So he does. He goes outside, he gets dressed, he gets the shovel. Mind you, it's not a snow shovel, it's a garden shovel, but, you know, because we don't have snow shovels in Southport, North Carolina. Um, but he goes outside and, he's, and he starts shoveling the driveway. Uh, in March, I took Nathan to New York City. When I presented the idea to Brayden, he looked at me and he said, there are a lot of people in New York City. Why in the world would you ask me if I wanted to go to New York City? <laughs> okay, fine, we'll go to Charleston so we can do the history stuff. So I took Brayden to Charleston the following week. But taking Nathan to New York City is an adventure. So first of all, you need to know that Nathan has ADD. He is the stereotypical kid. You spend five minutes with him and you're like, oh yes, this kid has ADD. So I was a little concerned about taking him to New York City where like 
everything was very distracting. But we, you know, it was just him and I. My full attention was on him. It was a fun trip, so we were, we were good to go. First airplane ride, first trip to New York City. Now, mind you, we live in Southport. The boys have been raised in Southport their entire life. So this is the first trip to the big city. Get on the airplane, we get up to LaGuardia, no problem. We get off the airplane and Nathan says to me, so one of your friends coming to pick us up from the airport? I said, no, we're gonna take a taxi. And he went, a taxi. And I went, in my head, I'm like, do you know what that is? Like, I'm trying to remember like why he can't, you know, why he's asking me about a taxi. And I go, you know what a taxi is, right? And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, I know, yellow car. Right, okay, yellow, yes, we're gonna go downstairs, we're gonna get in the yellow car, and whoever's driving the yellow car is gonna take us. How are we getting the taxi? Going downstairs, we're gonna get in line. Now, in my mind, I've done this hundreds of times. I've been to the city many times, right? But everything is a new experience for him. So he's like, I'm not sure about this whole. So we get downstairs in the taxi line, and as we're waiting for the taxi, he says to me, so do we know the driver? <laughs> no, just whatever you want, whatever taxi we get in. He goes, so wait a minute. You mean to tell me that we're getting in a car with someone we don't know and he's gonna take us to the hotel? Yes. We don't know this person, and we're getting in the car with them. Uh-huh. I'm not sure this is a good idea. I'm like, okay, well, here's the deal, buddy. We're at LaGuardia, and our hotel is 30 minutes away by car, so we can't walk to the hotel. We don't really have any other options. Why can't one of your friends come? Because my friends don't have cars. We're in New York City. I'll explain that to you later, right? So he, I'm like... On that fine line between like getting frustrated with him and then trying to explain to him that this is New York City, this is just the way things work. For 11 years of his life, what has he been told? Never get in a car with someone you don't know, right? Never, ever, ever, okay? Yes. So, number, you know, that's the first mind blowing thing that happens. So, we get in the taxi, and of course, our taxi driver is a male of Middle Eastern descent. So, and the, the, which that is not a problem because the boys have been raised to, to like everybody, right? So I say good morning to the taxi driver and I say, this is my son Nathan, it's his first trip to the city, we, but we'd like the most direct route to the hotel because you know, I know how these things work. So in his very thick Middle Eastern accent, he says, okay, fine, not a problem. And he starts talking to Nathan. And Nathan is like me, he talks to everybody, but he's like, super quiet. So I lean over to him and I go, it's okay to talk to the taxi driver. Like this is what we do. Like he's just trying to ask you what you're doing and how, how was your plane trip, whatever. He leans over to me and goes, we're not supposed to talk to strangers. Because <laughs> for his whole life he has been told, do not talk to strangers. It's fine buddy, we're in the taxi. It's someone we don't know. It's fine, it's not a problem. So we get to the hotel. We get near the hotel and the taxi driver says, I'm gonna drop you off at the, at the corner because your hotel is in the middle of a city block and you can just walk to the hotel. Okay, sure, fine, no problem. Feel his tug on my sleeve. What do you mean he's dropping us off at the corner? I thought he was taking us to the hotel. Mm -hmm. This is fine, our hotel is in the middle of a city block, so we're gonna get out of the taxi, we're gonna walk to the hotel, it's totally fine, okay. So at this point, I'm really glad we've raised the boys to trust us, right? Because I have to rely on that in explaining all these things to us. So he gets, we get out of the taxi, and I said to him, one hand on the suitcase, one hand on the taxi, I've gotta pay the taxi driver, don't move. Okay, now in my mind, I'm thinking, he has ADD, I don't want him to be like wandering off while I'm distracted. Okay, I had no worries about that. That kid was not going anywhere. Because when he got out of the taxi, his face was just like, like he was kind of shell-shocked because all the people, we, we were staying near Times Square, so it was a very busy corner, and people walking around, all the honking and all the traffic and everything. So pay the taxi driver, get Nathan away from the curb. I have a backpack on, he has a rolling suitcase. 
I said to him, okay, buddy, let's go. And I take a step, and as I take that step, I get the sense that he's not with me. <laughs> and I turn around, and he's still standing, like, right here. And I said, buddy, let's go. we got to get to the hotel. We've got things to do. And he goes, Mom, I was waiting for the people to go by. <laughs> and I went, mm-mm. You can't wait for the people to go by. You'll be standing on that corner all the time. And he goes, well, that's not very South Portonian. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. But we are not in Southport. We are in New York City. And here's what happens. When there's a break in the people, you just got to go. And you say, excuse me, as you're walking. That's all we're going to do for the next 24 hours. And everywhere we walk, it will be, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Because you will be bumping into people because there are people everywhere. <laughs> Okay, mom, whatever. Oh, and by the way, you are walking in front of me at all times, and you have to be within arm's length. None of this walking two city blocks ahead of me stuff like we do at home. But why? <laughs> but why? Why can't I walk? I'm not going to go anywhere. Do you not see all the people? You will get lost in the, in the waves of people. You have to stay right in front of me. And when we come to a crosswalk, you do indeed have to come to a full and complete stop and you have to pay attention. Not like in Southport where you can kind of glance over your shoulder and just keep walking because people will stop and let you go across the street. He's like, okay, I got it, I got it. All right, so, so I said, all right, we got all this taken care of. We walk into the hotel and the front desk clerk greets us. And there is a, you know, there's a room right there by the front desk where the suitcases are stored and the porter comes out. The porter is very clearly more than six feet tall, African-American, and he speaks to Nathan with a Jamaican accent. <laughs> and as we're walking towards the porter, I'm saying to Nathan, so we're gonna drop off our bag, we're gonna go have lunch, we're gonna walk around for a little bit, we'll come back when our room is ready. What do you mean our room isn't ready? Well, buddy, it's 12.30 and we're not checking in until, never in his life has he been to a hotel where he, we have not checked in and gone straight to our room. Because every other time we've traveled, we've always arrived in the evening. So we're gonna leave our bag with someone we don't know <laughs> and go have lunch and walk around. Uh-huh. And how am I gonna get my bag back? So at this point, the porter realizes that he's a little freaked out about leaving the bag. And his very thick Jamaican accent, which I am not going to try to imitate, he said, oh, don't worry, little man. I'll take good care of your bag. And Nathan looks up at him and takes a step back like this and looks at me and looks at the porter and he says, I'm going to need to get some stuff out of my bag. To which I looked at Nathan and I said, no, you don't, because I packed the bag so that you don't have, everything we need is in my backpack. All the clothes are in here. You don't need anything out of the bag. And he goes, <coughs> I'm a little concerned about the clothes. <laughs> no, I understand. It'll be totally fine. <laughs> so the porter gives, explains to Nathan about the tagging process. And he shows him the tag and we write our name and our room number on it and he takes off the, the perforated part and he hands it to Nathan and he said, now when you and your mom come back, you hand me this, I will be here. You hand me this, I will match it to the tag and I will make sure you get your bag and I will make sure that no one else gets your bag. And Nathan kind of looks at him and then he hands me the tag and he goes, you better put this in a safe place. Got it. <laughs> Better put this in a safe place. So then we go, we go about our trip to New York City, and we had a wonderful time. We, had, we went to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and we went to see Frozen on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Sunday, we almost missed the flight, because you do, in fact, need a full two hours at the LaGuardia Airport to go through um, security and such. And if you ask Nathan what was his favorite part of his trip to New York City, he will include in his list how we had to run through LaGuardia Airport and we were the last people on the plane. Because that was very, that was funny to him. It was stressful for me, but it was funny to him. <laughs> so my life with boys is anything but boring. I have two boys with two distinct, very different personalities, which sometimes can be frustrating, but very often leaves, leads to some very humorous moments as well. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to give this speech because it really made me stop and think about all those funny moments that will kind of override the frustrating moments as well. Thank you.